Did you know, dear friends, that in 2022, the total spending around the world of governments on military hardware was $2.2 trillion? Closer to home, did you know that there are 25 states in the United States that permit almost anyone to carry a concealed firearm with a permit? And there is one state, I'll let you guess which one, that prohibits carrying a weapon openly in public but permits you to carry one concealed with no permit. When recently I was away for a couple days getting ready for Holy Week, I went over through Maryland and West Virginia and coming back somewhere along the way, I saw a sign that said, True Patriots Come Armed. Oh dear. Those who were in church a couple of weeks ago may remember the statistics that I quoted, that in 2023 there were over 18,000 gun deaths and that's excluding homicide, uh, excuse me, excuse me, excluding suicide. That's just someone shooting someone else. And there were over 650 mass shooting events in the United States. You can do the math to figure out how many there, that means there were in any hour, in any day. We did not go a day statistically without these things happening to us and to those around us. Whatever you may think about any of these things, whatever you may think of the way that we solve our problems, it seems pretty clear that we as a species are addicted to solving problems violently. It seems pretty clear that we don't really know how to do it any other way, and there's something in our hearts that tells us, however evilly, that there is something cleansing about hitting someone else striking someone else. And we as faithful people, I think, must recognize that if you read big chunks of the Bible, there is plenty of justification for that. If you read the Torah and the prophets, there's a whole lot of smiting going on. There's a whole lot of calling for violence as a religious duty against one another, as a way of expressing righteousness. That has always been troubling for people of faith. It certainly has always been troubling for Christians. There was one early heretic in the, the Christian movement who told his followers only to read the New Testament. He, he, he jettisoned the Old Testament entirely because he couldn't reconcile the God of love in the New Testament with the God of, that appeared to be the God of, of smiting in the Old Testament. Lately, I've been talking to a parishioner in one of our, our Christian education sessions uh, who put it in a, a kind of a clever way, saying that God had tried that way and discovered it wasn't going to work because we were too thick-headed for it to work. So God had to try something else. I want to suggest to you that what God is doing in Holy Week, what God is doing on Good Friday, is trying a new way, a way that calls out the human addiction to violence and shows it for what it really is, a dead end, literally, a way that will not produce the life and the salvation that we hope that it will. Certainly, our fascination with violence is only made worse when there is money involved. In the story that we hear this morning, that the subtext of it is men who had money who went looking for someone who would get them Jesus. And they found Judas. Now, I suspect that some animus against Jesus, some concern with the way Jesus was living out his ministry was already in Judas's heart. There are a variety of theories about who Judas was and what he was about. Some that are the most disturbing suggest that he thought Jesus wasn't radical enough and wasn't really going to deliver for Israel what it needed. Some who suggest that the hope was that by creating this, this, this violent scene, the whole society would be overthrown, thrown into chaos, and somehow that would force God's hand, force God to act. You may know that right down to the present day, there are Christians our fellow believers who are convinced that if the Dome of the Rock, the mosque that is presently on top of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, were to be destroyed, 
the hand of God would be forced, the temple would be rebuilt, and the, the, the promised age of God's perfection in the, in the world would be, would be forced into being. And not very subtly, they suggest that some people should be doing something to start making that happen. Something subtle like that, or perhaps not even subtle like that, I think was going on with these people who were trying to provoke Judas and who finally found the right mechanism to do it. Apparently, it was 30 pieces of silver, and that's all it took. Jesus seems to know what Judas is going to do. And it's not just in the Gospel of John where Jesus is in charge. We know that to be the message of the Gospel of John. Jesus is always aware and is, is fulfilling the purpose God has set. But it appears in the other Gospels as well that Jesus has some idea who this person will be and what this person will do. He doesn't seem to stop him. That's troubling. I think it's worth asking, why does Jesus not stop him. One of the things you may have heard me say in one of my meditations on silence during Lent was this idea that somehow the only power God truly has is silent love. In the end, all God can do is love us silently. And so, in a way, to resist would be to play into the world's way of doing business. There is a sense, I think, that, in, that salvation must be accepted voluntarily. It can't be forced on us. In the end, salvation at the point of a sword never works. We as Christians have had to learn that repeatedly as well. And we continue to try to toy with it whenever we get the chance. Here is Jesus calling that out. As I've been saying for the past two days as I preach these Holy Week sermons, the cross is calling these things out, and today it's calling out violence. But it's also calling out the way the world does business more globally. There was a, a Roman Catholic Archbishop of Chicago who preached what he called a consistent ethic of life. Now, parts of that are complicated because they're dealing with issues that we are deeply divided about in our culture still, but what he was saying is you need to value life in all forms for all reasons. And in addition to all of the obvious forms of death that he included in there, he also included things like human trafficking, exploitation of people economically, every other way you can imagine. These are little deaths. Yeah, okay, the person is left alive, but how have we honored the image of God in that person? We haven't. I think what Jesus is calling out is the world's way of doing violence to all of us in different ways at different times, even though perhaps we have become so used to them that we no longer even notice them and no longer even name them. This, dear friends, is perhaps the ultimate purpose of Holy Week and the cross, to call out all of the ways that we distort the image of God in ourselves, in one another, in the world, in the universe. Sadly, dear friends, as we reach this point in Holy Week, we have to acknowledge that the world will have its counterfeit victories along the way. Good Friday is plenty of evidence of that. But in the end, the true victory belongs to God and will not be denied. Easter comes regardless of Good Friday, regardless of the world's contempt for the purposes of God, regardless of the world's ignorance of the purposes of God. And so, dear friends, we continue on our walk through Holy Week, noticing all of the towers of this world that are being knocked over, as Jesus walks through these days. Which ones remain in our hearts? Which ones remain that appear to be too powerful to be cast down? Now is the time to pray that they will be. If God defeated death, there is nothing else that will stand. Let us be committed to that in our hearts, in our lives, as we live out 
what happens in the next four days. And so be able once again to be greet with joy God's victory at Easter. Amen.